Welcome to the Sober Circle Channel. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Sheldon Fetty, I'm an alcoholic. It's uh, nice to have gotten some sleep between last time I seen you guys. So it's uh, we. Um, so last night we we talked about this selfishness and self-centeredness, this thing that drives me, this prison in my mind that I'm in. And the next order of business for me is to try and identify where that really exists in my own life. I, uh, you know, when I I got sober, my sponsor would tell me all the time, you got to read 60 through 63. You got to read, I'd go to him with any problem. You know, the guys in the home group would do it. Or you need to read 60 through 63. How my work life is, this is going on in my body. You need to read 60 through, it's almost like he didn't really know what to tell me. So he would tell me, read 60 through 63. And trying to identify the selfishness and the self-centeredness and the self-centered fear and the thing that drives me was very, very difficult for me until I actually got down to business, paper and pen, and wrote out these resentments. But when I was new and somebody would say, you know, you need to do your fourth step. Have you written your fourth step? What about the fourth step? It's a very scary proposition for me. I don't know what it's like in Alabama, but in Vegas, if you go to a meeting and you say that you want to talk about step four or you're thinking about doing your fourth step, you'll get a couple of different responses. One of the responses you'll get is, ooh, ooh, don't do that. That's scary. It's terrible. Another response you'll get is good, because if you don't do a false step and you don't do it right, you're going to die. You will die if you don't do your false step. So I know one thing. I know it's scary. I know that another thing is that I'm going to die if I don't do it. And anything that's scary and that might kill me, I'm not really interested in at all. And then the other thing is, is that you'll get a hundred different versions, workbooks and processes and all these confusing different ways that you could write a false step and ways that it could look. And so I'm confused and I'm afraid and I'm scared and I'm going to die and I don't know what to do and I'm stuck. My sponsor took me to the big book and he said there are some really simple, clear-cut directions on how to do an inventory out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, what's funny and what has amused me over the years is that when you hear people talk about step four out of the big book, you'll hear some people refer to it as a four-column inventory. It is four columns out of the big book. Sometimes you'll hear people refer to it as a five-column inventory. I'm not sure if if this is a four-column group or or a five-column group, right? But we all swear we're doing it out of the big book exactly the way it's written in the book. I personally do a six-column inventory. Right, because I'm an alcoholic and the more is better, right? And, and we're gonna, we're, hopefully we'll have time and we'll talk a little bit about what those six columns are. But one of the things that I think is super important is to understand that what is really important here is that we do the inventory. And exactly what it looks like is less important. Now that might sound like AA heresy. There are people in Alcoholics Anonymous who I love and respect that will tell you if you don't dot the I's exactly where they dot the I's and you don't cross the T's exactly where they cross the T's, you're doing it wrong. They'll tell you that people in AA, unless you you are exact in your format, we're killing people around here, which I take a little bit of of a resistance to. In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous in Bill's story on page 13, it talks about Bill going through the steps. It talks about the process that he did. And it talks about that process before his white light experience. Bill's white light experience that we talk about, the Bill Wilson spiritual experience, happens on page 14 after he goes through the steps. But if you look at the way he went through the steps, our our founder, the foundation of the program that saved my life, he did it wrong. So we should all be dead. (laughs) So the experience is the experience. The work is the work. We're looking for God. And there's mystery and there's, there's mysticism and the spirituality exists in the spaces and in the gaps. What's really important, though, is that we do the work that we do. What Don was talking about yesterday, 
that we seek God. The exact format of how we do it is less important than the fact that we're seeking. Having said that, if I'm your sponsor, I have an exact format where we will dot the I's my way and we will cross the T's my way. And if you don't do it the way I show you, you're going to die. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about what that format looks like. It says on the bottom of page uh, uh, 63, it says, next we launched on a course of vigorous action. It gives me a timeline of how quickly I'm supposed to start this work. Right after I get up off my knees from doing that third step prayer, the book says we launched. And launched, I think, gives me a timeline, right? I mean, if you're going to launch, you're going to do it when? Like now, right? I mean, you can't really launch slowly, right? I mean, I suppose you could, but the slowest you could launch would be 10, 9, 8, right? I mean, that's a slow countdown to a launch. We go quickly. On the course of vigorous action, we're going to take some effort and we're going to do some work. And this is really the first time that we're going to do an outward display, that we're going to actually do some real work in Alcoholics Anonymous. It feels like one, two, and three are work. But really what they are is contemplation and thinking about my, my favorite topic, me, right? But now we're actually going to do some physical work. It says, therefore, we started a personal inventory. A business that takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. I'm, I'm in the car business. And uh, we have to do inventory all the time. We have to know what we have, what we own it for, what the values of it are. It says that if we fool ourselves about values um, 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 and we don't get rid of the damaged or unsaleable goods, we're in trouble. And in my life, what I had to do is I have to look at what it is that is driving me, what it is that I think is important, what it is that is running through my head constantly. I don't know if you're like me. I'm the guy that when I go to bed at night, I'm constantly doing inventory. I'm thinking about what those sons of guns did, what they said, what they didn't do, what they're supposed to be behaving like, what they're doing wrong. I'm running all this stuff through my head and I gotta get this out and gotta get this on paper. The book says at the bottom of 64, it says resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. I got a note in my book above that with a question mark that says more than whiskey, more than whiskey. If you, if you have the experience, and I'm sure many of you do, of going to detoxes or treatment centers, and we always find that guy that's in treatment and he was sober for a while. Not the guy that couldn't stay sober, but the guy that had a couple of three years or five years or, or 10 or even 20 years of sobriety. And he found himself getting drunk again, and he's, he's sitting in the treatment center. I was always interested by that guy. And I want to go up and I want to ask him, what happened? Because from self-preservation, right, I want to know what it was that ended that guy back up in, in treatment. And you hear a lot of different stories, but a lot of times what you end up hearing is, well, you know, she was doing this, or my boss did that, and they've got this anger towards something that happened as their excuse, their reason for drinking. Now, we all know that it's kind of nutty, right? I mean, I've never had a problem or a resentment that drinking couldn't make worse. But resentment seems to be the thing that drives many of us out. Because I get blocked from God. I get that noise in my head. I get the comments and the anger and the ba 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 My sponsor likes to say that when I'm in that head state, I wouldn't be able to hear God if he was on my shoulder with a bullhorn. All right? When I've got that noise in my head. So resentment seems to destroy more alcoholics than anything else because it can drive us back to drinking. But what about that guy in your home group or that time in my life where, where I felt this way, where I've managed to stay physically sober, but through resentment and anger, I seem to be separated from everybody around me. I don't, I'm not able to have a good or happy life. I'm locked up in fear. I'm locked up in anger, <clears throat> in judgment. <clears throat> everybody around me, I see problems and trouble, and, and it just feels like, like life is difficult, and I'm unable to have any happiness or joy. People in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I know there was a great tragedy here uh, uh, recently. Uh, I've, I've heard many stories and known people very close to me in my community in Las Vegas that resentment gets them to a point where they feel so alone and so separate that they end up making the supreme sacrifice. And so, and so we, can, we can get in trouble in many different ways, and drinking is one of the ways we can get in trouble. But resentment and anger and fear and frustration and the things 
that step four and then step five are designed to give me relief from can cause me trouble not only by driving me to drink, but by leading me to have a very difficult and miserable, angry life, and also lead me to make that supreme sacrifice. So resentment seems to cause more trouble for us than anything else. I have to be free if I'm going to be able to live any kind of a successful and enjoyable life. I have to be free of this stuff. So how do I do it? How do I, how do I get free? And the book gives me this set of directions, and at the bottom of page 64, it says we listed the people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. So I'm simply going to make a list. I'm going to write a list of the people that I'm mad at. And when I start to write my full step, I have this strange idea that somehow I'm different than everybody else, right? I think that my full step is going to be unique. I really don't want to write that stuff down because I don't want to share it with you because you're going to judge me horribly. And I just know that you're not like me. But if you're new, I got to tell you that we could write your inventory for you, right? We, we don't because it's fun to watch you squirm. All right, but first name on the list, dad. Second name on the list, mom. Third name on the list, my current wife or girlfriend. Fourth name on the list, my brothers and sisters. Fifth name on the list, my boss. Sixth name on the list, my previous girlfriend or spouse. Seventh name on the list, my previous boss, then my previous girlfriend, then my previous boss. And then it trickles down through my uncles and aunts to anybody that's had any meaningless contact with me in my pathetic little life to this point so far. If, if I've had more than a couple of conversations with you, you're going to be on my inventory. <clears throat> One of the names that was on my inventory was my <clears throat> third grade lunch lady. I was 28 years old when I shared my first inventory. I was six or seven or eight when this lunch lady was serving me lunch. I had a real resentment against her. I hated her. The way that she did this, poof, just really... And I, I carried that with me forwards in life. The first name on my list was my dad. I hated my dad. My dad left when I was two years old. The next name on my list was my mom. Living with my mom when I was a kid was very difficult. She was a, a, an angry woman, and she, she suffered from panic attacks and withdrawals from society because of, of whatever, and I just didn't feel any love from her, and I hated my parents. And my brother was on the list, and so on and so forth. So I write these names down. And then it says we asked ourselves why we were angry. Well, I was angry with my dad because he left. I was two years old. I was two years old when he left, and I tell you, he didn't just leave me. If it had just left me, that was one thing. But he didn't, he didn't just leave the home. There wasn't just a divorce. You know, I had other friends that were divorced, that were in a divorce situation, and the dad stayed in town. The dad would be there every other Wednesday, and he'd be there on weekends, and he'd show up to their sporting events, and he'd be there for birthdays, and he'd be there for holidays. But my dad, when he left, he left the town of Leeds where we grew up, and he moved to London 200 miles away. And from London, he moved to Canada. From Canada, he moved to Southern California, which is how my family, or how he ended up going from uh, uh, England, where we were born, to Southern California. And he ended up living 6,000 miles away, and I would see him once a year, if that. And so he didn't only, it wasn't just that he left my mom, but he left the whole family, and I hated him for it. I hated him for leaving, and, 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 and he, then he asked what was affected, and everything's affected, right? Financially, we were affected. I was affected because I felt like I didn't have a dad in my life. I wasn't taught anything. I didn't get my own way there. I didn't feel loved. I felt cut off. I felt different. I felt separated. Every area of self was affected. <clears throat> um, Self-esteem, my financial security, personal relations, everything's affected. And so I start out writing this inventory very similar to the diagram on page 65. I've got three columns. I've got column one, I'm resentful at my dad. Column two, the cause because he left. <clears throat> column three, what's affected. Everything really except sex relations. Self-esteem was affected. Se uh, 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 security, personal relationships were interfered with. The whole thing, my whole life is turned upside down by this with my dad. My sponsor said to me, and I do this with guys that I sponsor that are brand new in AA. If you've been around a while and you come to me and you want help, I'll have you write the whole inventory on your own. But my sponsor did something with me that I think was very effective, and I do this with guys that I sponsor. He had me only write the first three columns, and then we wrote the rest of the columns together while we did my fifth step, which I think was so important for me because I wouldn't have been able to find the insights that I was able to find by myself. 
So the next name on my list is my mom. My mom, uh, I didn't feel like she loved me enough. She screamed and yelled a lot. She, I felt judged by her. Uh, I felt like she held back from me a lot. And what was affected, again, everything's affected. So I showed up to my sponsor's house with this three, these first three columns written. And we start to talk about my dad. Uh, uh, and I tell you, I was unable to let my dad off the hook. You know, my, my reaction, if you would have asked me why I drank, if you would have asked me why my life was a mess, I would have told you it was because my dad left when I was young. Before my dad left, we were a middle-class family in a Jewish neighborhood. I, my dad left, and we become a Section 8 family on the wrong side of the tracks, a welfare family, food stamps, the whole nine yards, a lot of prejudice growing up. I was the oddball in the community. My whole life was my dad's fault, and I drank because of my dad. If my dad hadn't have left, I probably wouldn't have ended up an alcoholic drug addict. Everything was his fault, and I hated my dad. And my sponsor's trying to get me to let him off the hook. He's trying to explain to me that I need to find some freedom from this anger towards my dad, and if I can't find this freedom, I'm likely to drink again. But I can't find this, I can't find a way to let him off the hook. And my sponsor says to me this thing that made me crazy. He said, you know, maybe your dad did the best he could with the tools that he had at his disposal. Well, I'm thinking get new tools. All right. I mean, that, that, that sounds good for somebody that's, you know, on the outside of my life, somewhere over here, oh, I could find a way to forgive him. But this is my dad for crying out loud. My entire life is ruled by this. And I can't let my dad off the hook. And we talk about my dad and we talk about my dad. And I can't let my dad off the hook. The bottom of page 66, it says, this was our cause. We realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. Though we didn't like their symptoms and the way they disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick too. Though we didn't like their symptoms, what, what they did to me, column two, or the way they disturbed us, the way it affected me, column three, they, like ourselves, were sick too. And he's trying to direct me to find a place where I can see that I'm like my dad. And I can't do it. So he gave up. And we started to talk about my mom. And he said, what about your mom? Tell me about your mom. And we talked about my mom. And we talked about her anger. And we talked about the way that she was towards me. And we talked about the fact that I didn't feel loved by her. And we talked about her panic attacks that she would have and the anger that she would have. And we started to talk about this part of the book. He says, you know, though you didn't like your mom's symptoms, which I didn't, or the way they disturbed you, they, like ourselves, were sick too. Could you imagine, Sheldon, if you were in your mom's shoes? Could you imagine if you were left with two young kids? Could you imagine if at that early age you found yourself trying to raise these two boys by yourself? Could you imagine with the pressures and the difficulties that she had what it might be like to be her and how you might have been in trying to raise those boys. And I'd never considered it. It says in the book, in the middle of the page there, it says we were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. I had never considered what it was like to be my mom, what it might have been like to be in her shoes. It had never entered my head. And I started to think about what it might have been like to be her. And if I'm honest, if I'm having a slightly bad day, Let's say the alarm doesn't go off or I sleep through the alarm and I'm running 10 minutes late. When I come downstairs to the rest of the family, am I whistling? Or am I like, get out of my way, hurry up, for God's sakes, you guys are blah, 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 blah. I don't have to be under a lot of pressure to behave like I'm cranky and irritable. Right? The pressure my mom was under, what might it have been like to be her? What might it have been like for her to live that life? And I start to consider for myself my mom's life and how it might have felt to be her. And you know, it's shocking to me now as I look back that I had never considered that. It had never entered my head what my mom's life might have been like. And I started to, if I'm honest, I started to think how I might have behaved in her shoes. I have a, a, a beautiful wife and a great son and I've yelled at my son inappropriately. Anyone that's a parent has found themselves sitting on the couch after they've sent the kid to his room and screamed at him thinking, oh my God, I'm so out of line. And I compound that with what it would have been like to be my mom. 
I start to get a little bit of compassion for her. I start to think to myself, if I was in her shoes, would I have behaved any better? And the truth is, is that I probably would have behaved worse based on my own experience with the way I am in my life. And I don't immediately let my mom off the hook. It's not like all of a sudden I want to go buy her roses and chocolates and run over to her house and, and cry at her feet. But I start to get a little bit of compassion for what it might have been like to be her. This is a sick man, the book says. When a person offended, we ask ourselves, uh, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful? God save me from being angry. In the middle of 67, it asked me, where had I been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Where had I been dishonest? I had imagined that my mom was really capable of giving me the love that, that I wanted or demanded. What I thought, the way that I, I believed my mom was, and it's a little embarrassing to admit this, the way that I believed my mom was is that my mom could have done better easily, just decided not to. It's almost like I imagine she sat in the living room after me and my brother went to bed and thought, I could have been nice to them today, but I wasn't. <laughs> And when I think about what it must have been like for her and the way that I treated her in light, in light of her difficulties, what kind of son was I? In light of, of the way that my mom was struggling trying to raise us two boys and everything she went through, it says, where were we to blame? Where were we to blame? What kind of son was I in light, of, in light of the struggles my mom had? And if I'm honest, I wasn't a good son. If I'm honest, I, you know, I stole from her and I was disrespectful and I just, I just was a real pain in the ass is what I was. Not coming home, drinking, stealing money from her, screaming and yelling back at her. Uh, uh, just, a, just a bad deal. And in the middle of this conversation, my sponsor says to me, let's talk about your dad again for a minute. Why? He says, well, you know, you say that your mom had some stuff going on that was difficult. She suffered from panic attacks. Your mom was a person that had a personality that was a little bit difficult to deal with, and all of that is true. He said, do you think that developed after your dad left, or do you think she was kind of always like that? Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Do you think it's possible that your mom and dad might have got married early? before they really knew each other. Do you think your dad, maybe, would have found himself in a marriage that, that was difficult for him? Do you think your dad, maybe, when he came home into that house and he put his hand on the door to come in the, in the room, like you had described, it was for you sometimes coming home from school, that he was afraid to go in the house because it wasn't, it, there, was no, there was no fun or love for him there? Do you think maybe your dad found himself in a position where he looked at his future and he saw himself in a bleak and gray marriage and he didn't see any joy for his life and he felt like he was walking into a prison cell. And it wasn't your mom's fault, but it was the way your dad felt. Do you think when your dad looked at his future, it might have looked gray and dark? I don't know. If you were in your dad's shoes, if that was true, if your dad found himself in a difficult marriage and your dad imagined the next 50 or 60 years of his life to be gray and to be cold and to be no, no enjoyment in life, do you think that you would have stayed or do you think that you may have left? I don't know. I don't know. What would you have done if you were in your dad's shoes, Sheldon? You know, the sad truth is that when I was 16 years old, I went down to the local government and I claimed my mom had thrown me out and I signed on to my own welfare and got my own food stamps because I didn't want to live with it no more. What would I have done if I was my dad? I would have done exactly what my dad did. Where was I dishonest? Where was I self-seeking? Where was I afraid? I tell you, the dishonesty with my dad, and I'm, i got to cut this really short, but the dishonesty with my dad and the way that my life unfolded with my dad uh, 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 is so incredibly massive in my life. If you would have asked me, I would have told you that my dad ruined my life. 
That's what I would have told you. My dad ruined my life. The truth is, is that today I have a pretty good life. The truth is, is that today, you know, I have a, I have a great career. I own my own business. It's, it's a struggle, but it's always a struggle when you have your own business, and it's a, I have a great financial situation. Uh, I've, I'm married to a woman that adores me. I have a son that is a, a, a great kid. I have a great place in my community. Uh, I'm an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous with a million friends. And if you were to ask me why today, why is my life the way it is, you might be thinking it's because I'm an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous that creates that life, and you'd be partly right. But the truth is, is that the reason my life is the way that it is is because my dad left when I was two years old. See, when I was two years old and my dad left, I lived in a small town in the north of England called Leeds, and it's a nice town, but it's not Las Vegas, Nevada. The reason that I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada, where I've created my career, met my wife, and had my position in the community in Alcoholics Anonymous, the reason I'm there is because when my dad left and he moved to London, then he moved to Canada, then he moved to Los Angeles, and when I was 16 years old and in trouble, he moved me to Los Angeles, or Orange County, where I lived with him. And because my dad is the way my dad is, him and I got into some fights and arguments, and I left LA to get away from him, and I moved to Las Vegas. See, if my dad hadn't left, I wouldn't be in Las Vegas. And I might have a wife, but she may or may not adore me the way my wife adores me. I may have a son, but he wouldn't be the son that I have today. And I may have a career, who knows? It wouldn't be the white. My life wouldn't look anything like it does today. Where is the dishonesty with my dad? The dishonesty is so huge. The selfishness. What did I really want my dad to do? Did I really want my dad to be depressed and suffer and have no happiness for the rest of his life so I could get what I wanted? What am I really like? When I, when I think about my mom and my dad, in light of them not being mom and dad, but in light of them being human beings who part of their job was to be mom and dad, but they were much more than just a mom and a dad. And see them in three dimensions in a way that I had never seen them before. Some compassion and some freedom comes into me, uh, like a crack in a wall that allows me to start to see them as more than just their titles. And that's, I think, part of my problem in all of my life is that when I look at you and I look at humanity, I don't look at you as people. I look at you as the title that I assign you, and then I expect you to play that role or that title perfectly. And the problem when you're looking at the people in those roles through the magnifying glass of my mind, no one is able to live up to the standards that I set forth for them. This is such a vital and important part of the book, this 180 degree turn that can happen here in this inventory that it's almost a shame to try and get through it in such a short amount of time. I hope that, that I've been able to transmit to you a little bit of what happened with this relationship with my parents through this inventory, because then that trickles through. If I could be wrong about my dad, if I could be so wrong about my dad, couldn't I be wrong about my boss? Couldn't I be wrong about my brother? Couldn't I be wrong about the coworker, about the friend in the AA meeting, about the newcomer or the bleeding deacon? <laughs> Couldn't I be wrong about just about everything? So when I have the guys write an inventory, the inventory looks something like this, just to kind of give you titles to the six columns that I, that I, that I like to do with guys. And that, the first three columns are obviously like it is on page 65, I'm resentful at. The second column is the cause. The third column is what's affected. The fourth column is this was our cause. How am I like them? If I was in their shoes, could I imagine myself behaving the way they behaved? If I was driven by the fears they were driven by, had the concerns they had, could I have done what they did? The fifth column is where was I selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or afraid? And that last sixth column is what should I have done instead, or where was I to blame? I really wish we had more time for this. That's all out of me, though. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks for listening. Please support the channel by liking and subscribing.